everyone. So it is me, Jemmy. We are back today with our storybook right here. So I thought today that we could read the actual first chapter, The Wizard and the Hoppy Pot. So it says that it looks like it is uh, starts on page one and the commentary is on page 11. So it is a 10 page story. My hood's coming off. Ah. Could wear it like this i guess so let us read the first chapter last time we read the introduction and we can take a look at the commentary as well so if it does get really hot i may take a break and take off the robe because it is about 30 degrees celsius or 100 degrees fahrenheit so um I am going to maybe get a little too hot and I might need a drink of water. So if we do take a break, that's okay. We will be back and we will read the rest of the story. So here we go. Let's read the story. So the wizard and the hopping pot. So I've never read these stories before. So if I do mispronounce some of the words, I am sorry about that. So let's take a look. There was once a kindly old wizard who used his magic generously and wisely for the benefit of his neighbors. Wow, he sounds like a very nice neighbor. Rather than reveal the true source of his power, he pretended that his potions, charms, and antidotes sprang ready-made from the cauldron he called his lucky cooking pot. From miles around, people came to him with their troubles, and the wizard was pleased to give his pot a stir and put things right. This well-beloved wizard lived, a, lived to a goodly age and then died, leaving all his chattels to his only son, this son was of a very different disposition to his gentle father, though. Those who could not work magic were, to his son's mind, worthless. We all know some people like that. And he had often quarreled with his father's habit of dispensing magical aid to their neighbors. I would agree with the father. I don't know if I like the son's disposition. It's giving very Voldemort -y vibes. Upon the death of his father, the son found hidden inside the old cooking pot, a small package bearing his name. He opened it, hoping for gold, but found instead a soft, thick slipper, much too small to wear, and with no pair, a fragment of parchment within the slipper bore the words, in the fond hope, my son, that you will never need it. What is the son going to do with one slipper? Yeah, he might need a slipper someday. The son cursed his father's age-softened mind, and then threw the slipper back into the cauldron, resolving to use it henceforth as a rubbish pail. Well, that seems like a waste. Such a good cauldron. Why would you waste that? <sighs> Young people today don't know anything. That very night, a pleasant woman knocked on the door. My granddaughter is affiliated by a crop of warts, sir, she told him. Your father used to mix a special poultice in that old cooking pot. Be gone, cried the son. What care I for your brat's warts? and he slammed the door in the old woman's face. Well, he is a very terrible person. And once there came a loud clang and banging from his kitchen. 
The wizard lit his wand and opened the door. And there, to his amazement, he saw his father's old cooking pot. It had sprouted a single foot of brass and was hopping on the spot in the middle of the floor. Well, that is odd, isn't it? Making a fearful noise upon the flagstones. And the wizard approached it in wonder and fell back hurriedly when he saw that the whole of the pot surface was covered in warts. Oh, well, that is terrible, isn't it? Disgusting object, he cried. And he tried firstly to vanish the pot, then to clean it by magic, but magic didn't work. And finally, to force it out of the house, but none of his spells worked. However, and he was unable to prevent the pots hopping after him out of the kitchen and then following him up to bed, clanging and banging loudly on every wooden step. Oh, I hope he doesn't break those stairs. The wizard could not sleep all night for the banging of the warty old pot by his bedside. And the next morning, the pot insisted upon hopping after him to the breakfast table. Clang, 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 went the brass foot, footed pot. And the wizard had not even started his porridge when there came another knock at the door. An old man stood at the doorstep is my old donkey, sir, he explained. Lost she is, or stolen, and without her, I cannot take my wares to the market, and my family will go hungry tonight. <sighs> I am hungry now, roared the wizard, and he slammed the door in front of the old man. Clang, 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 went the cooking pot a single brass foot upon the floor, but now it is clamor and mixed with a bray of donkey and human groan hungers echoing from the depth of the pot. Be silent, be still, ah, shrieked the wizard. Not all his magical powers could be, could quieten the warty pot, which hopped at his heels all day, braying and growing and clanging, no matter where he went or what he did. That evening, there came a third knock upon the door, and there on the threshold stood a young woman sobbing as her heart would break. My baby, she is gravely ill. She said, would you please help us? My fa your father bade me come if any trouble. But the wizard slammed the door in her face. I would help the baby. And now the tormenting pot filled to the brim with salt water of sopping tears all over the floor, is still hopping and brayed and groaned and sprouted more warts. Though no more vill villagers came to seek help from the wizard's cottage anymore, for the rest of the week, the pot kept him informed of their many ills. Within a few days, it was not only braying and groaning and slopping and hopping and sprouting warts, it was also choking and retching and crying like a baby, whining like a dog 
and spewing out bad bits of cheese and sour milk and plagues of hungry slugs. Well, this sounds terrible. The wizard could not sleep nor eat or do anything with that pot beside him, but the pot refused to leave and he could not silence it or force it to be still. At last, the wizard could no longer bear it. Bring me all of your problems, all your troubles, and all your woes, he screamed, fleeing into the night with the hopping pot behind him along the road into the village. Come, let me cure you, let me mend you, and I will come for you, comfort you. I have my father's cooking pot, and I shall make you well. Well, I mean, I would do the same thing if this was happening. So we are on page eight now. So this, there's a picture here, let me show you. So that is what the hopping pot looks like. And with the foul pot still bounding along beside him, he ran up the street, casting spells in every direction. Inside one house, a little girl's warts vanished as she slept. The lost donkey was summoned from a distant briar patch and set down softly in its stable. The sick baby was doused in dittany and woke well and rosy. At every house of sickness and sorrow, the wizard did his very best to gradually, to, and the gradually the cooking pot beside him stopped, stopped groaning, stopped retching, and became quiet and shiny and clean. Well, that is magic for you. Well, pot, asked the trouble wizard, as the sun began to rise and the pop the pot burped out a single slipper he had thrown into it and permitted him to fit it on to the brass foot together they set back to the wizard's house the pot's footsteps muffled at last. But from this day forward, the wizard helped the visitors, villagers, and any visitors that came to his house in need. Like his father before him, lest the pot cast off its slipper and, began, and begin to hop once more. The end. So I think that was a very good story. It had a good moral. So I think that the moral is saying that you should be thoughtful and help people. So let's see. What does Albus Dumbledore has to say on the wizard and the hopping pot? Although I think that it said in the beginning of this book that Magic could not cure all problems, but in this story, magic seemed to fix the problems. So let us read Dumbledore's commentary. It looks like there is, oh, this is quite a long commentary. Yes, it's about a 10 page commentary. So let us read the commentary as well. Okay, so let's see, Dumbledore, what do you have to say? A kind old wizard decides to teach his hard-hearted son a lesson by giving him a taste of local muggles' miseries. The young wizard, conscious, awakes, and he agrees to use magic for the benefit of non-magical neighbors. So he had seen the light of his ways. A simple and heartwarming fable, one might think, in which case one would reveal oneself to be innocent nincompoop. 
Wow. A pro-muggle story showing a muggle-loved father as superior in magic to a muggle-hating son. Is it nothing short of amazing that any copies of the original version of the tale survived the flame to which they often were so consigned. Beetle was somewhat out of step with his time in preaching a message below of brotherly love for muggles. The prosecu prosecution of witches and wizards was gathered was gathering pace all over Europe in the 15th century. Most in the ma magical community felt, and with good reason, that offering to cast a spell on the muggle next door's sickly pig with tenetamout to vol volunteering to fetch the firewood for one owns funeral prior. Let's see. Prior, it is true, of course, that genuine witches and wizards were reasonably adept in escaping the stake, blocks, and the noose. Okay. So, does it say anything else? Uh, yes. However, a number of deaths did occur. Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Proppington was stripped of his wand before being locked in a dungeon and was unable to magic himself out of his, of his execution. The wizarding families were particularly prone to losing the younger members whose inability to control their own magic made them noticeable, vulnerable, especially to those muggle witch hunters. Let the muggles manage without us, was the cry as wizards drew further and further apart from the non-magical brethren accumulating with the institutional of the International Statue of Wizardry Secretary in 1689, when wizard kind voluntarily went underground. Children being children, however, the grotesque hopping pot had taken hold of their imaginations the solution was to jettison the pro-muggle moral, but keep the warty cauldron. So by the middle of the 16th century, a different version of the tale was in wide circulation among wizarding families in the revised story of the hopping pot protects an innocent wizard from being porch bearing, pitchfork trotting, totting, neighbors by chasing them away from the wizard's cottage, catching them in the swallowing them whole. Catching them and swallowing them whole. Well, that seems dark. At the end of the story, by the time the pot had consumed most of the neighbor, the wizard gains a promise from the few remaining villagers that he will be left in peace to practice magic in return, he instructs the pot to render up its victims who are duly burped out of its depths, slightly manged and mangled. And to this day, some wizarding children are only told the revised version of the story by their generally anti-muggle parents. And the original if and when they had ever read it, comes as a great surprise. As I already hinted, however, there are pro-muggle sentiments was not the only reason that the wizarding and the hopping pot attracted anger. As the witch, hunt, witch hunts grew even fiercer, wizarding families began to live double lives, using charms of concealment to protect themselves and their families 
by the 17th century any witch or wizard who choose or chose to fraternize with muggles became a suspect, even an outcast in his or her own community. That is terrible. Among the many insults hurled at pro-muggle witches and wizards, such as fruity epithets, such as mud wallowers, dung lickers, and scum suckers, dated from this period. Well, those sound like very bad swears. Was the charge of having a weak or, or inferior magic. Influential wizards of the day, such as Brutus Malfoy, okay, well, he is probably related to Draco, editor of Warlock at War, an anti-muggle periodical, perpetuated the stereotype that muggle lovers was about as magical as a squib in 1675. Let's see, a squib. A squib, for everybody who does not know, is a person who is born of magical parents, but who has no actual magical ability themselves. So Brutus wrote, this we may state with certainty. Any wizard who shows fondness for the society of muggles is of low intelligence with magic so feeble and pitiful that he can only feel himself su superior if surrounded by muggle pig men. Nothing is a surer sign of weak magic than a weakness for non for a non-magical company. This, fortunately, prejudice eventually died out in the face of overwhelming evidence that some of the most world's most brilliant wizards and witches were, to the common phrase, muggle lovers, such as myself, Albus Dumbledore. The final objection to the wizard and the hopping pot remains alive in certain quarters today. It is summoned up, summed up best perhaps by Beatrix Bollocks, Bollocksum, 1794 to 1910, the author of the famous Toadstool Tales. Miss Bollocksum believed that the tales of the beat of the bard were damaging to two children because of what she called their unhealthy preoccupation with the most horrid subjects such as death, disease, bloodshed, wicked magic, unwholesome characters, and bodily effusions and eruptions of the most disgusting kind. Miss Beluxum goes on to take a variety of old stories, including several of Beatles, and rewrote them according to her ideals, which she expressed as filling the pure minds of our little angels with healthy, happy thoughts, keeping their sweet slumber free of wicked dreams and protecting the precious flower of their innocence. The final paragraph of Miss Beluxum's pure and precise precious reworkings of The Wizard in the Hopping Pot reads, Then the little golden pot danced with delight, hoppity hoppity hoppity, with its tiny rosy toes. Wee Willy Winkins had cured all the dollies of their poorly tum-tums and the little tiny pot was so happy it filled up with sweeties for wee willy wickens and the dollies but don't forget to breath your teethy pegs cried the pot 
and wee Willy Winkins kissed and hugged Hoppity the Pot and promised always to help all the dollies and never to be a grumpy old Wumpkins again. This sounds dreadful. I would not want to read Miss Beluxum's version of the tale. Miss Beluxum's tale had met the same response from generations of wizarding children, uncontrollable, retching, followed by immediate demand to have the book taken from the shelf and mashed into pulp. Yes, that is what I would probably do with that book too. Okay, so it looks like that was the end of Dumbledore's comic, uh, no, commentary on the tales of the wizard and the hopping pot. Okay, so let's review the story. So what did you all think? You can comment, like, down below. Tell me what your thoughts on the wizard and the hopping pot were. I thought the story was quite good. It seemed to have a very good moral about helping people and being kind to others. So I believe that this Beatles version of the tale is far superior to Beluxum's version of the tale. It seems that our next story is going to be The Fountain of Fair Fortune. Now, I haven't read any of these stories, so I have no ideas or any hints about what they will be about. So let's go through this journey together. Next time we will read that story for part three of our series for the tales of the beetle the bard. So I hope everyone has a great, magical, wonderful day. And you remember to be nice to your neighbors and good things will happen. So remember karma, it's a great thing, but also a powerful thing. So have a great day, like and subscribe, and we will be back next time for the fountain and the fairness of it. So, have a great day. Bye.